something else that goes with the discharge. So if a sutures treatment plan is increasing its nutrient discharges, it's probably increasing its heavy metals, it's probably increasing pharmaceuticals, and all the other things that are bad for public health and bad for the environment. Uh, this is a quote, that, or a cartoon from the air context, but it's, it's the same sort of, <laughs> uh, applies in the water context, which is, you know, trading, in the sense it was carbon trading, it lets uh, polluters off the hook, its stewardship becomes secondary to private business interests. So now you can really pay to So why is it bad for communities? Um, pollution trading causes hot spots, so disparate impacts in uh, low-income and minority communities who already bear um, most of the pollution burden in our country. And EPM Bay states have long ignored uh, the potential impacts of trading on low income and minority communities. In the air context, now in the water context, when they came out with this Bay TMDL, we, when we commented on it, we talked about the social justice impacts, they basically ignored it and said, oh, this TMDL is good for everybody, so it's good for those communities as well. Um, as Fred mentioned, they've got executive orders out there that require them to um, address, assess, and address environmental justice impacts. And they've done none of that. They've just proceeded to make this you know, the new way of you know, water policy making the way and uh, control. So trading takes a few sources of pollution um, and concentrates them in a single community. So uh, in, the, in the case of Baltimore, there's three training regions in Maryland. It's Potomac, Patuxent, and everything else. So Baltimore, for example, all the Eastern Shore Ag communities, those, those credits that are generated there could be concentrated and probably will be. Baltimore. Um, so you're going to see lots of increases in those um, urban waterways, and it's going to be particularly problematic for social justice communities because we know um, they often have a number of anglers that they rely on fishing to reduce their food costs and put dinner on the table. Um, in Baltimore, for example, there was a study out to the 2005 survey of anglers that found that among Baltimore that anglers, roughly 40% of them made less than both the median and mean incomes for the Mid-Atlantic region. 99% of the Baltimore anglers live within 25 miles of the fishing location. Um, African Americans constitute a third of those anglers. Other minority fishermen, including Hispanics and Asians, constitute the, the rest of that population. And again, a notable portion of these folks said fishing was um, somewhat or very important to, to putting food on the table and reducing the food costs. Those folks are going to be the most impacted. Um, Anna Costa is saying, saying I think there was a recent angler study, right, just a couple weeks ago that talked about the thousands of area anglers that are consuming toxic fish in the Anacostia. Um, Fred mentioned Genon. The first proposed trade in Maryland is for Genon. Uh, they have two power plants in the Potomac and one in, in Fred's watershed and Top Point. Top Point uh, has an 8% Latino and African American community. Um, and, and, and they will no doubt be impacted there. So the power plant industry, as you mentioned, as an aside, is really participating across the country. There's another big uh, trading program in Ohio that they recently announced. It's not formally blessed by EPA as an MOB. There's no legal action that can be challenge. Um, but we're seeing this trend because air pollution regulations have gotten better and they're forced to sort of scrub out the toxic air pollutants. They're just shifting them to another medium. They're just shifting to your waterways. So we think we're making progress in the air front, but actually we're now poisoning our waterways and our communities. Um, So this is sort of a morbid cartoon where a gentleman is selling his right to murder because in some states, you know, if someone breaks into your house, you can kill them legally. Um, and this is sort of uh, the extreme case, obviously. But my point here is that there is a slippery, slippery slope. We've got trade for nutrients now, but there's lots of actors pushing the feds to, to include toxics, for example. The National Association of Clean Water Agencies is pushing EPA to broaden their scope of pollutants that, they, that can be traded. And while you're getting toxic already, even with your nutrient sediment trades, um, you know, for sure, once you start to trade your mercury and your other toxic pollutants, the impacts are going to be even greater, and the effects are going to be, health impacts are going to be greater in these um, just, social justice communities. So I don't want you to just take my word for it. We've had air trading in, uh, for a longer period of time. So while we don't really have any successful water pollution trading cases, I've looked, there are water Program, trading programs, I've not found a single program where they can show that trading has improved water quality. We do have lots of examples of fail, failed air trading schemes. And so we can learn lessons there. Unfortunately, lessons that we're learning from the air schemes is that you have immoral outcomes and you have ineffective outcomes. So there's two um, Los Angeles examples. There's a great article by the Duke Environmental Law Journal that plug in Duke and social justice and 
Google and you can find it's a huge URL, so I didn't include it on the side slide. But um, it talks about two programs in particular, particular Rule 1610, where oil refineries could purchase credits from scrapping cars. So there was a lot of fraud involved in this program because they weren't actually scrapping the engines, but they were reselling the engines. But the, the idea was they're taking pollution sources off the road and, the, and that pollution was being bought up by oil refineries. Most of the credits were purchased by four oil companies. They were located in uh, four communities. Three were located close together and were 75 to 90 percent people of color. Uh, so um, again, you're taking diffuse, what are would be otherwise diffuse automobile pollution and concentrating in these four communities. And they were training to increase their emissions of volatile organic compounds. And a component of VOCs is benzene, it's a carcinogen. Um, and exposure to benzene can cause leukemia, anemia, respiratory tract irritation, and pulmonary edema, and hemorrhaging. So those four communities were bearing the brunt of all this additional VOC, legally, legally VOC pollution. Um, another, I wanted to talk about ineffective outcomes as well, because on top, to make matters worse, <laughs> so the retain was an urban smog reduction program. Every program that we've looked at, even if there have been reductions, they've been far fewer than what had been happening under a traditional regulatory scheme. So the NOx emissions that were reduced um, under the reclaim program, they were getting reductions of 37% in LA communities, but 3% reductions after reclaim went into effect. They, the fact that they abandoned that program eventually as being ineffective, but not after industry got effectively 10 years of amnesty and, and were able to avoid pollution you know, upgrades. Uh, similarly, the acid rain program, which we hear a lot about, they got 29% reductions US did under the acid rain program, while the European Union that um, declined to do a training program and had a uh, traditional regulatory approach for the same exact pollutants, got 79% reduction, Japan got 82% reduction. So not only are you poisoning communities that already burden um, most of the pollution, you're not even <laughs> you're not even being effective right then in terms of uh, what you what you could get in terms of uh, the, regu the traditional regulatory scheme. So um, this last slide is about someone who wants to stay in bed so he can sell his <laughs> carbon credits. Um, the point of this slide is we shouldn't take this line down, right? This is a serious problem um, because, again, they produce morally acceptable outcomes, hotspots, and disempowered communities. Then you've got a whole other layer of fraud and fraudulent emission reductions that is a whole other Presentation. And unfortunately, there's a groundswell support for pollution training from our mainstream environmental community. Um, some are just outright pro training, some are pro training with quote unquote appropriate safeguards. We don't think that you can safeguard against creating these hotspots. We think it's inherently wrong. Um, we think making our waterways tradable commodities is inherently wrong. We think um, taking away our fundamental right to clean water is inherently wrong. And certainly, it's inherently wrong for those folks to profit on the backs of our most disenfranchised communities. The good news is it's relatively new in the water context, so we have this lawsuit hoping to kill it all together, but um, in the meantime, we have to be vigilant at the local and state level, and so we're looking for um, dissidents, as <laughs> um, Fred said, um, to fight permits in local communities like in um, the Genon situation. There's probably gonna be legislation this year. We need to hold all of our public officials accountable. We need to tell them not to be supporting passing legislation that, again, gut our regulations and replace them with these market-based systems. And so, uh, and, and without a doubt, if we win our lawsuit, you'll see federal legislation, you'll see Congress trying to change, and we've had this, even from among our friends, Senator Cardin in the past, trying to amend the Clean Water Act for the Bay States, but it will pave the way for everywhere else to try to amend the Clean Water Act to allow for this kind of training system. So, to the extent that you feel, you know, you'd like to help out with this, or that you're going to be impacted in this community, please reach out to me, we'd love to um, work with you to try to you know, Again, I invite anybody if there's any hard press question or anything um, that you need to have, <laughs> otherwise we proceed. And who's coming to the dais right now is, uh, you know, Dottie Young, Chesapeake Covenant Community, amongst her many roles. And, uh, She's been engaged a lot in stewardship issues around the, the Chesapeake Bay and Anacostia River and other waterways. Yes. <clears throat> so hello, I am uh, Donna Younger, the executive director of the Chesapeake Covenant Community, which is a group that is working to bring together the houses of worship 
in the Chesapeake Bay watershed to, um, to green their ministries and to green their facilities, to be good environmental stewards. Uh, I also uh, work with the Anacostia Watershed Society and I'm the former Anacostia Riverkeeper. Um, and am in the process of becoming an ordained uh, United Methodist minister. So I'm talking to you today with several hats on, and I'll try to keep all the hats straight. Um, so, um, one of the reasons, a few years ago, uh, when I was the Anacostia Riverkeeper, I uh, started attending the DC Environmental Health Collaborative's um, annual regular meetings. And this was a group of healthcare professionals and environmental groups and community groups um, and some pastors who had come together around issues of environmental health in um, the Anacostia watershed. And I was particularly struck by a pastor who was there. And he said the reason he was there was because one Sunday morning, several of his families were not in worship because they were in the emergency room with their children who were having asthma attacks. And his first thought was, is there something about our church building that is making our families sick? And so um, they looked at all of the aspects of their building, of their facility, paint that they use, the white bulbs they use. They looked at all of that, and there was nothing about the building itself and then they looked at where their church was located within the Anacostia watershed. And as it is the case across the country, and especially true in the Anacostia, your zip code in the Anacostia watershed will tell you as much about your health as your doctor will, as we heard this morning. And his uh, congregation was near the Pepco Benning Road power plant. It is now offline but for many, many years it was not. And as the Anacostia Riverkeeper, I knew that there were conversations being had with the district, with PEPCO, and with the federal government about that site as a contaminated site and the contamination not only on the land, but in the water. And I knew that the communities around that, um, that area were a cancer cluster. Bad news was that uh, even though they had gotten the attention from the federal government and been recognized as a cancer cluster, the federal government had said, well, because you were so close to so many different kinds of pollution sources, the power plant, 295, uh, other things, you used to be next door to the DC landfill, because they had so many different sources of pollution, no, no one of those could be pinpointed as causing the cancer, and so everybody was let off the hook for causing the cancer um, in this cluster. Anyway, this is where this, this pastor's congregation was. But when he realized that it wasn't his church making his parishioners sick, it was where his church was located, and he started to become aware of the environmental issues around his church and the environmental health issues, he felt a moral obligation to get involved, and that is what led him to be at the DC Environmental Health Collaborative. And so I use that as an illustration of um, the work that I am doing um, to bring houses of worship, to bring people of faith to the conversation about environmental health and public health and the intersection. We've heard talk about uh, the Chesapeake Bay order, the executive order from um, President Obama. And for years, for decades, um, various groups, as Fred has talked about, have been at the business of trying to clean up the bay. We have had all of the usual suspects involved in this. We've had uh, federal agencies, we've had state agencies, we've had the District of Columbia, we've had environmental groups. But all of those um, usual suspects have only gotten us so far in our cleanup efforts. And what, what the Chesapeake Covenant community is trying to do is, um, is say that there are uh, groups of folks who, um, have been, who have been around, who have been part of us all of this time and haven't been recognized as uh, groups of folks who should be involved um, in this discussion, hence the Scooby-Doo uh, uh, reference. 
Whenever you get a Scooby Doo reference into a talk, I think it's, it's a good thing. Maybe I'm just dating myself. Maybe I'm just dating myself. Actually, and before I go on, I, I, so I want to uh, take a step back because Fred was also talking about um, the use, uh, how power is um, used and distributed or not distributed or withheld um, within it, these conversations. And, and what I am. am I too am, am talking about power. I'm just calling upon a higher power. Um, and whatever higher power um, um, people uh, believe in, or what ha whatever higher power um, uh, folks recognize, doesn't have to be my particular higher power. Um, so, some of the things that the, the Chesapeake Covenant, that I want to give some specific things that the Chesapeake Covenant community is, is working on and working with other groups to do. Um, in, in various areas. Um, and we have focus in urban areas in Baltimore and in the Anacostia, and then also in rural areas on the Eastern Shore. And one of the things that Brad has also talked about is the sense of place and connecting people with uh, their sense of place, the, the poet and the farmer and the philosopher and I would a very prophetic voice as well, although he would, he would not appreciate that. Um, Wendell Berry says, you don't know who you are if you don't know where you are. If you don't know where you are from. Um, and so um, a lot of this is trying to connect folks to knowing where they, who they are by um, the place that they are from. And some folks have a very rich understanding of their sense of place. And the fishermen who are fishing along the banks of the Anacostia and catching those cancerous catfish um, have a deep sense of place, um, but they also aren't, for the large part, and we have found in a recent fishing study, aware of the risks of eating the fish out of the Anacostia. Um, and, or if they are, they know that they're not sick today and they're hungry today, their families are hungry today, and they need to put food on the table. And if they can get sick in 20 years, well, they'll worry about that in 20 years. But there's the urgency of today. Chesapeake Covenant Community has been working with the National Capital Region Watershed Stewards Academy. And um, we have other folks here from the academy that um, um, should feel free to talk uh, with as well. And the Watershed Stewards Academy actually began in Anne Arundel County. It's uh, a way of connecting um, citizens um, with the environmental issues that are facing their local rivers and streams. Uh, people sign up for this academy and they meet once a week for about uh, 15 weeks and they learn everything from what is stormwater, what is a watershed, what watershed do they live in, what are the environmental challenges that are in their local watershed to how can they address those local, um, how can they address those issues themselves. Um, for example, if the issue is stormwater, then uh, they get training in how to install a rain barrel or how to build a rain garden, how to plant native plants. And then there is funding through the program for them to design their own project that's going to address this pollution within their watershed, um, and then and, and then implement that that project. And a lot of times um, they can get additional funding from either the state of Maryland, from the Chesapeake Bay Trust, from the District of Columbia. They, there are other places they can get money to be able to uh, to address these issues. Just recently, our um, the third class that we did in the National Capital Region, we did it entirely for the faith community, for people of faith. It was open to all faiths, but everyone who, um, who participated in the academy had some connection to a faith community, to a spiritual um, community. And what we, what we talked about a lot throughout the, the course, we talked a lot about stormwater and best management practices and what is a watershed, but we also talked about what is the sense of place. Um, and we also talked about um, what is the particular uh, moral voice that the faith community has to add to um, this discussion of environmental health and public health? And now um, these folks are going back to their congregations and putting in their capstone projects at their houses of worship. And in some cases, the students have surpassed the master. One of our um, <laughs> 
um, watershed stewards um, goes to um, a synagogue on uh, 16th uh, Street in Northwest, and she got a grant from the District Department of Environment for $65,000 to um, install best management practices to install green infrastructure on her at her synagogue to control the storm water there. And so her house of worship. Um, will now be doing what it needs to do to be a good neighbor uh, in its watershed and, um, and to be a demonstration of what other congregations can do. And now the steward, Carla Ellern, is now uh, a resource in that community for other folks and other congregations to be able to do the same thing. And so through this academy, the idea is to build this fun of uh, stewards who are able to um, help um, others in their community do the same kinds of things. There are lots of reasons, in my opinion, to engage the faith community in our discussions around environmental health and public health. Some of those are very pious reasons. Um, most of the major um, uh, spiritual or faith traditions have an understanding of um, a care for creation. Um, and um, have even you know, their denomination or their faith tradition have put out some sort of statement for um, the denomination as to um, our need to be good stewards of creation and the either biblical or theological or spiritual foundation for doing that. But a lot of times there are also some just really practical reasons uh, for houses of worship and people of faith to get involved in these issues. Um, this is a picture of East Washington um, Heights Baptist Church. And um, they have, they over, the church has been uh, in the Anacostia watershed um, for decades. And uh, over the years they have built additions to their original building. And so they have two buildings that are connected by this walkway. That's the roof of the walkway that you're seeing. And that leads that one um, pipe, that one downspout, is leading off of that roof into that window well there. And during the summer, after a heavy rain, they call that window well the East Washington Heights Baptist Church swimming pool uh, because it fills up with water and those windows lead into um, their fellowship hall. And so this is a serious stormwater issue, a serious flooding issue they have here. When I went to the and uh, talked with the pastor of this congregation, I went to listen to him about what, the, what is going on in his congregation. Um, and he didn't say, you know, only we could, you know, meet the terms of the Bay TMDL, or if only we could get the, the president's executive order implemented, or gosh, those whips are just keeping me up at night. He didn't say any of those things. He's like, I got this flooding problem. What am I going to do? Uh, and so we talked about that, and then we also talked about this congregation's connection to the Anacostia River. Was there ever any connection to the river? Congregations, um, especially east of the river, used to baptize their members in the Anacostia. No one would try to wash away anybody's sins in the Anacostia River anymore. I always said as the riverkeeper, I wanted to see the river fishable, swimmable, and baptizable again. And so you have congregations here who have lost their sense of place because they have been cut off from the Anacostia River and the ways that they have used it. What we could do is I could talk to this pastor and say, you know that bag bill that went in a couple years ago? And he's like, yes. Who was the schmuck who made us pay five cents more for plastic bags? And I would say, well, I'm one of those schmucks. Um, but... Um, because of that five cent on that plastic bags, on those plastic bags, that's all going into a fund, into an Anacostia restoration fund. And that fund is now available for restoration projects. And because of work that we have done, we've gotten the District Department of the Environment to, edit, to take proposals from congregations directly. So you can put in a proposal to a congregate, to the District Department of the Environment to get those monies back. You can get your nickel back to help deal with your flooding issue here. It also is going to control the stormwater that's running into the Anacostia River. Um, and so there, and that's going to make you a good upstream um, neighbor for your, folk, your fellow uh, brothers and sisters who live downstream from you. And I promise you we're trying to get your upstream neighbors to be good stewards of their 
because you're downstream of that. All of us are downstream of somebody somewhere along the line. Um, and so there were um, many different approaches um, with this congregation. When that bag bill was getting implemented, um, 20 years ago, um, the district department, the district, tried to implement a bottle bill. And it went down in flames, and it went down so badly that nobody will even discuss revisiting a bottle bill. And what happened was um, the American Chemistry Council came in and um, went to congregations east of the river and said, this is going to be a hidden tax on the poor. This is going to be a hidden tax on you. And uh, your government officials are just trying to tax you more. They're trying to make this more expensive for you. And what happened was east of the river got pitted against west of the river, west of the river being in support of the bottle bill. When you pit east of the river against west of the river in DC, you pit black against white. And it became, the bottle bill became a race issue. It became a referendum on racial politics in the city. And it failed miserably. When this bag bill was being, was, was coming up, I went to congregations east of the river and sat down and just talked with them. Again, about their history of their church, their, his, their use of the Anacostia River, how they would like to see the river today. And of course, everybody said, yes, we want to clean Anacostia River. But we're trying to feed our families, and we're trying to pay their electric bills, um, asking us to, to deal with you know bags on top of all this is too much. We could support this if we could make it easy for our folks. And so we realized that what we would need to do is get bags to everybody we could, and as many bags as they, as they needed. And in that way, the pastors could be on board with helping clean up the Anacostia, but not doing it at the expense of their, their congregants, and at the extent of their um, parishioners. You should keep me on time, because if I can go. <laughs> well, in, in light of that, if you could wrap it up, that would be great. <laughs> exactly. um, and, so, uh, and so I think that, to me, I have always, I remember that lesson uh, when, I, when I continue to do this work. That it is about dialogue and it is about finding common ground and it is about um, making, uh, um, uh, hearing where people are and what their needs are in order to, to bring them to the table. I just want to close with, um, <coughs> Uh, a quote from um, Gus Speth, who is the director, the dean of the Yale um, Forestry School. Uh, and the Forestry School has now combined with the Theology School to offer a joint program. And my husband said, please tell me we're not going to have to go back to school. Please <laughs> let that degree go. Um, but Gus Speth was talking to a group of pastors, and he said, I'm a scientist, and I used to think that if we just had bigger and better science, we could get ourselves out of our science problems. And I used to think that our three greatest science problems were climate change, pollution, and um, biodiversity loss. And the pastor said, well, that's great, but we're not scientists, so we don't know what to do. And he said, well, I now no longer believe that climate change pollution and biodiversity loss are our three greatest problems. I now actually believe that as a society, our three greatest problems are greed, apathy, and pride. And those aren't science problems. Those are moral issues. And science can't speak to those moral issues. You, as the religious community, can speak to those moral issues. The religious community has had a long history of speaking out on important moral issues, slavery, civil rights, women's rights. And many folks describe the environmental crisis that we are seeing as a civil rights issue, the civil rights issue of our day. And the faith community has a particular moral voice that it can bring to those issues um, and has a particular way of bringing together folks in the dialogue to have the conversations in order to be able to move forward. Thank you, guys. Oh, so. Are you using the PowerPoint? Yeah, I am. Uh, I need guidance because I've got a few-minute presentation. We've only got a few minutes left. To, uh, yeah. Well, you know, obviously we might not be able to do the Q&A as we had hoped to do, but let's go ahead with the presentation, and if you can keep the time in, the better.
we're going to have plenty of time this afternoon to discuss these issues at length in the solutions that we're getting. Okay, hi. Um, my tendency is going to be to talk fast, which is not a good idea, uh, because I've got to do the presentation, there's 15 minutes left, exactly. Um, and I know this is a lot of talk, so I apologize for that. Uh, I'm going to try and not go 15 minutes. Uh, my name is Robert St. George. As you can tell, I'm the project director of the Pesticides and Chesapeake Bay Watershed Project. We're six years old. We uh, work on pesticides in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we are part of the Maryland Pesticide Network. We're a project of the Maryland Pesticide Network, and that means um, that we draw upon a very diverse community of um, public health experts, water keepers, watermen, federal and state, county government agency representatives, people from the agriculture community, environmental community, and even at times the pest management industry because we want to keep the dialogue going as much as we can and try to get them to at least minimize their applications. Uh, in various ways and use techniques that would minimize that. I mean, ultimately, our goal is to try to minimize runoff and, wherever possible, to eliminate pesticide runoff into the bay uh, because it's doing a lot of bad things that probably most of you are aware of. Um, this is a slide that I am stealing from Dr. Linda Birnbaum, who is the director of the National Institute of Environmental uh, Health Sciences. Uh, she spoke recently, about six weeks ago, at our annual conference, and she asked, uh, you know, should we be concerned? Um, all these things, these bad things are going up. Testicular, testicular cancer, breast cancer. Hypospadias is a congenital defect of the urethra. I'm not going to try to explain it much better than that, but it's bad and it affects the boys. Uh, and sperm counts are going, that's one thing that's not going up, it's going down, uh, as you probably know. Um, she also asked, a little bit of this is fading out here, but, um, uh, should we be concerned about an increase in diabetes and autism and ADHD and an increase in asthma? Now, we're not trying to say that these are all solely caused by pesticides, but there is an increasing body of evidence and, and an accelerating number of studies that have come out slowly over the last 20 years and now really over the last 5 to 10 years that show clear links, at least partially, between uh, pesticides and these disorders. Um, this is a key point to understand. Um, traditionally, what our, our, our regulatory system was based upon the notion of the dose makes the poison. The larger the quantity of stuff you're exposed to, the worse it is. And to some degree, that's still largely true. But that, that long-held conventional wisdom is running into something called endocrine disrupting chemicals that you've probably heard about, and a lot of newly emerging research uh, this is what Dr. Greenbaum said, uh, actually, in an editorial uh, that she wrote for Environmental uh, uh, Health News, uh, which is, I don't know about you, but it's, it's my sort of daily, you know, biblical reading, no offense religiously, <laughs> too, uh, in terms of uh, what, I, what I get about uh, general aspects of environmental issues. Um, and that low doses may be unsafe even for populations not typically considered vulnerable. Um, I, there's, there's a lot of endocrine disruptors out there. I want to focus just for a moment on two. Atrazine uh, is a, one of the most commonly applied herbicides in the United States. It's used on corn especially, uh, and also all those other things. Uh, and Christmas trees. Think about that this season. Um, I actually didn't know that, or I hadn't absorbed it until I was putting together research for this presentation, and I noticed it. It said evergreens used to be harvested for Christmas trees. Wow, okay. Triclosan is also really bad stuff, and there's growing research, particularly in the last three or four years. This is in antibacterial soaps. It's in toothpaste, uh, although some of the makers of toothpaste uh, are, are naturally taking it out because the, the more people find out that this stuff is in toothpaste, the less likely you are to buy the brand of toothpaste and put that stuff in your mouth. It's um, so one thing to put it on your hands, which is bad enough, but in your mouth is even worse. Um, what do pesticides do? Lots of bad things. I'm not going to explain this entire chart, but uh, you know, fumigants, uh, fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, and their impacts uh, on 
you know, neurological, uh, childhood cancers, we're, we're focusing particularly here on children, uh, birth defects, reproductive developmental stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and most at risk from pesticides in general are these folks. Um, these are not in any order of importance. Uh, underserved communities in particular for some of the reasons that have already been stated here, as well as some others. Um, sources of exposure are just about everywhere in terms of pesticides. Uh, and subsistence fishing, you know, we've already heard a bit about um, going out particularly you know, around, in this area, around D.C. and around, and around Baltimore. Um, I like to think of lack of information as a source of, expo of, of exposure. Because the less well informed you are about this stuff as a consumer, as a citizen, as a member of a grassroots community capable of taking action, uh, the more likely it is you're going to be exposed. And that is an issue that I would like think in particular a problem that I think it affects much more uh, underserved communities than a lot than your, your typical sort of middle class place where I live in, in, uh, in Maryland. Um, what are other people doing? This is just a short digression. Uh, the European Union banned efforts eight years ago. Eight years ago. We're fighting battles about it. Canada uh, has, most of Canada, okay, has banned cosmetic use of lawn pesticides. You just don't need this stuff. Anybody who has studied the history of how lawn pesticides came to be, they were never really applied to lawns to any great extent until after World War II when the pesticide industry kind of maxed out the amount of stuff it was selling to the agricultural community and said, where can we develop a new market? Let's create a problem. The problem being